Now I'm going to describe how climate varies across North Africa and the Middle East. It doesn't have as much complexity as Northern America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Why not? Because it's mostly a bee climate. So we can see in North Africa, but also in the Middle East on both the left and the right, we see a lot of red. And if we go to the key, what does red mean? Red means it's a desert. It's a B climate. Once again, we're mostly focusing in here on A, B, C, D, and E climates. In the case of this particular region, we ain't gonna see D and we ain't gonna see too much E. Uh, there are some places where we do see some D climates, but that's only in the extreme upland areas. And you can see that up there in Turkey. So Turkey is first off the most northern place uh, part of this Middle East region, but it's also got a lot of highland areas. It's quite rugged. And so subsequently, that's why we see a little bit of purple there in Turkey. So there is some D climate. There is also some C climate. Where do we see some sea climate? Also up there in those areas with a little bit higher elevation. But guess what? We find the Mediterranean climate region along the Mediterranean, go figure. And we can see that in two different instances. And so you can see that in the terms of Mediterranean in the Middle East map, there where we see Israel and Syria and, and, and coastal parts of Turkey along the Mediterranean, but also in the Africa map, we can see it there in North Africa, in parts there in Libya, parts there in Tunisia, uh, parts there in Algeria and in uh, Morocco, but essentially there on the other side of those rugged mountainous areas that we've already talked about, the Atlas Mountains. So a Mediterranean climate we do find here in uh, the uh, North Africa Middle East region. However, what do we see overwhelmingly is a B climate. And so what's going on here is we have the dominated, uh, you know, the, the, the high pressure that is always in this area, that subtropical high pressure, high pressure equals dry. And so the Sahara Desert is so stinking dry because the subtropical high pressure is always hanging around overhead. Over in the Middle East, same true with Egypt in the Arabian Peninsula, in the Arabian Desert is because the high pressure is always hanging around. And so it leaves behind a lot of cloudless skies, high pressure dry, no clouds, no rain. But also with that means, you know, with no clouds, we get extremely high temperatures in a rather warm area. So this is gonna be very, very hot desert in this particular area of the world. And so to sum up the climate regions before I go a little, more, a little bit more into the nuances of, of, of these, this particular region is we do have a little bit of variety and a lot of that variety is related to the fact we have highland areas and water bodies, but overwhelmingly we're mostly a bee climate. Here we have the temperature maps for January and July. First off, some things we know. You can see the role of, of being along a coastline in terms of moderating temperatures. On both maps, you can kind of see how the edges of, for, for example, the Arabian Peninsula or the area along the Mediterranean coast, those areas along water bodies, you can see how kind of the edges uh, are different than what we see more farther inland. In the case of the January map, in the case of the Arabian Peninsula, it has that kind of that yellow coastline going all the way around it. And then inside it's got the green. So that's the role of, in the case of January, a water body kind of keeping the nearby area a little bit warmer than it would otherwise be if it was farther inland. Same with the Mediterranean Sea. We can see kind of a green line along the coastline, but we go a little bit further south or a little bit farther inland and we see it's blue, it's cooler. And so once again, the role of the Mediterranean Sea for kind of warming up up temperatures along the coastline. And then we see the opposite there in the summertime. Now there is an exception, that exception would be the Persian Gulf. You can see the Persian Gulf gets extremely hot during uh, the summertime. It really doesn't do a good job of cooling the nearby areas. Why is that? It's because it's so shallow. It's a very shallow water body. And so because of that, just think about the shallow end of the pool, it doesn't take much to heat it up. And so it stays cooked very, 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 cooks very, very quickly. And so it actually causes a situation where it actually increases temperatures at night uh, because that water is retaining all that heat and holding that heat, and then it distributes it on the land overnight. Some other patterns that are clearly that we see here when we look at temperature is the role of upland areas. Uh, so we can see upland areas in terms of cooling temperatures, uh, but we can also see a little bit of the influence of latitude. If we look at where we see Iran in both maps, we can see Iran in terms of, of the Zagros Mountains. 
uh, and then up in Turkey, uh, we can see the Caucasus Mountains. We can see those upland areas, variations in temperature, and that variation in temperature is definitely cooler uh, there in the winter time, but also in the summertime. That's from the elevation, the role of altitude. Now, when we compare the January and the July precipitation map, uh, we can once again see the role of being located near a water body uh, increases your chances of having precipitation. Duh, kind of makes sense. If you have a nearby uh, source of moisture, it's going to increase the chances of actually that moisture going to come uh, onto the land. So we can see that definitely in the case in January when we look at uh, along the Mediterranean. So you, what we have going on there also is the predominant pattern there is we have the mid latitudes, kind of a, the northern air brings moisture onto uh, the North Africa landmass. And so there we come across the Atlas Mountains and we can see precipitation. Same goes for the Middle East where we can see orographic precipitation from the mid latitudes bringing moisture uh, uh, there in Turkey, but also there in uh, the Zagros Mountains and Iran. Uh, so Iran does get some precipitation in certain parts, but in other places it's quite dry. It all depends on where you are located in rela relationship to those mountains. I've already explained that beforehand. So for the most part here, we can see variations in, in temperature and precipitation related to being near a water body or having an upland feature nearby. Another thing to note is you actually find the highest temperatures in the world. Some of the highest temperatures in the world have actually been found in the Sahara Desert and the Arabian Desert. Why is it so high there? So you're talking, we're talking 120s, 130s. Uh, is, is not uncommon. So what's going on there is it's very much tropical. So we have very much, we're, we're very close to the equator, so we're going to get very strong, powerful uh, incoming solar radiation from the sun. But unlike the tropical rainforest, they've got that dense cloud belt that's always up above, and so it kind of helps to prevent that incoming solar radiation from coming screaming through the atmosphere and hitting the land surface. In the case of the, both of these deserts, there's no clouds, and so what that does is it's all day long superheating of the surface from that incoming solar radiation that has nothing blocking its way, and so that's why temperatures can actually get up in this particular area of the world higher than any other place we'll find. And of course, all this temperature, precipitation, it's more than just doing it for the hell of it and talking about it just for fun. It also relates to agriculture, which then helps to relate to population density and where we find people living. So in this case, we can see a map that shows different rainfall, but also the type of vegetation or agriculture, domesticated vegetation that we f should find in a particular area. And so much of it is desert. And so we find nomadic herding and all of that. We find in some places we do get enough precipitation, kind of that semi-arid step, very similar to what we'd find in the Great Plains, to, you know, where we could grow some wheat, some barley, some grains. But in some areas, we can then get uh, corn, tobacco, what we'd find maybe more in the Midwest or the American Southeast, where we get enough moisture, where we can grow those types of, of crops.